In this video, we're going to introduce the three most important definitions for asymptotic notation, those being big O, big omega, and big theta. These are going to be sets that we use to describe the growth rates of functions. So we're trying to describe a growth rate, meaning that a function grows either slower than another function, faster than another function, or at about the same rate as another function. So we're trying to capture an idea of less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and equal to, in some sense of growth rates. That's what we want to try to capture here. Our definitions here will look a bit clunky with symbols, but they're to accommodate for some fringe cases that we'll see as we're going through some examples. For all three of our definitions here, we are going to have two ideas. One, that we want to talk about what happens to our algorithms in the long run for very big inputs. We don't really care what happens for small inputs. This is because we want to capture the idea of a growth rate. How does it grow? And for a growth rate, that's a long-term behavior. So one of the things we have is that we assume n is greater than some value, but could theoretically be arbitrarily big. This is like a limit you might have seen in calculus. The, the way we define this is a very similar way to which you define a limit in calculus. You're trying to say that something happens eventually. So what we want to be able to say is that f of n is bounded above by some other function, g of n, with the hope being that that g of n function is a more convenient thing to deal with and to talk about and to compare to other things. So for example, maybe you have a polynomial that looks like n squared plus 4n plus 6. That's not necessarily that ugly, but a lot of those details aren't important in the long run. For very large values of n, if I plug in, for example, 4,000, 4,000 squared is much bigger than any other term that would appear inside of that equation. So in some sense, the n squared is the most important part. So we want to be able to say that the n squared is the most important and that this thing doesn't really grow any faster than n squared. It's bounded above, in some sense, by n squared. So for example, we might say it's less than or equal to 2n squared. How did I come up with the 2? We'll explain this later when we actually go through some examples of doing this on our own. But for now, somebody just told me that 2 will work. But it doesn't actually work, because if you plug in, for example, n equals 0, on the left-hand side, you get 6 less than or equal to 0, which is not the case. So that doesn't work. What if I plug in n equals 1? On the left-hand side, I get 1 plus 4 plus 6. On the right-hand side, I get 2. That still doesn't work. How about n equals 2? On the left-hand side, you get 4 plus 8 plus 6, less than or equal to 2 times 4. Still not really working out for me here. What if we plug in n equals 10? Let's just skip ahead and see what happens. If I plug in n equals 10, though, on the left-hand side, I get... 10 squared is 100 plus 40 plus 6 is less than or equal to 2 times 100, which is 200. Oh, it does seem to work eventually. So, eventually this inequality is true. However, it doesn't work until sometime between n equals 2 and n equals 10. You could dial in on that exact value, but it turns out to not be that important, and we'll come back to that idea later. So, n squared plus 4n plus 6 is in some sense, bounded above by 2n squared. We would write that down in the following sense. n squared plus 4n plus 6 is in the set big O of 2n squared. So that says that it is a slower growth rate, or the same growth rate, as 2n squared. In practice, that 2 also isn't very important, though. Because the important thing is that the dominant term is n squared. So we aren't going to keep that 2 there. And we're going to allow that to exist in our definition. So now if we look precisely at the definition, we say f of n is in O of g of n if you can find two constants, c and n naught. The c is designed to capture this 2 here. We don't want to have to deal with those fiddly constants out front of expressions. We want to only care about what is the function not these constants that are multiplying it. So that C allows us to ignore that constant out front and just say n squared 
is grows no faster than n squared. And we want to be able to say that that happens eventually. Because you might have some function which grows really quick at the start and then kind of just tapers off. And we want to be able to deal with that contingency. So we have this n naught, which says that eventually you are bounded above by g of n. So we're going to amend my sentence I wrote here and write f of n is bounded above by g of n eventually. The bounded above, we're allowing for the, a constant to appear out front of the front function, and the eventually is captured by the n naught. We'll see this in a lot of examples where it will become more comfortable. Our next definition is very, very, very similar. It's the exact same idea, but for bounded below. So f of n is bounded below. by g of n, eventually. So all of the details are the same. The only difference between big O and big omega is that where we had a less than or equal to before, we have a greater than or equal to here. So as an example, n squared plus 4n plus 6 is greater than or equal to 1 half n squared. If you plug in n equals 0, you get... 6 greater than or equal to 0, that seems to check out, n equals 1. Here you get 1 plus 4 plus 6 greater than or equal to 1 half, also seems to check out, and you can keep going and show that this works forever. If you wanted to formally prove this, you could do so with induction. We will have some other techniques for developing constants that will allow us to avoid that. But since we've seen induction, you could prove that this inequality is true via induction. Same with the one above. So, the claim we're going to make here, just like before, is that that function, n squared plus 4n plus 6, is in a set, big omega, of n squared. Again, we get to ignore the 1 half. We, allow, we are allowing ourselves to absorb that constant into what we define, and it happens eventually. In this case, eventually was n equals 0. That's it. However... It could theoretically be a larger value like it was in the previous one where we happened to not show that our thing was true until n equals 10. So that is the value that we choose for that n naught for eventually. Eventually happens to be n equals 10. It might happen before that, but we chose 10. So we can bound things above and below to say it grows no faster than this function and grows no slower than this function. Graphically, what we're trying to do is say we have some horrible mess of a function that does some random nonsense and looks terrible. However, there might be a really nice function like n squared, which is above it the entire time, or eventually at least. So this function up here is our nice function n squared, and the horrible squiggly line is whatever we bounded above by n squared. The exact same picture can be drawn down here, but we have our horrible mess of a function that is bounded below by n squared, or some constant times n squared, and it again happens eventually. So we want to be able to say that this horrible mess that we're dealing with is always bigger than something and always smaller than something, with maybe a little asterisk next to always to mean that it happens eventually, but there's infinitely many values for which it's true. That's really somewhat useful, especially the bounding above turns out to be useful when you can tell someone my algorithm won't take any longer than some function. I can tell you, guaranteed out the gate, my algorithm takes no longer than n squared. That's already a useful thing to tell a user. However, it is more useful to say it, it will look exactly like some other function. So if we combine these two ideas, that's it. Just combine them. We get our theta notation. So using the two things we did there, we're just saying f of n grows at the same rate. as g of n. And again, eventually. So we, if we write down the two inequalities we had, n squared plus 4n plus 6 is less than or equal to 2n squared and greater than or equal to 1 half n squared. Sorry, 1 half n squared. Then in some sense, it looks like n squared, right? It's bounded up below by something that looks like n squared and bounded above by something that looks like n squared. It's sandwiched between them. Graphically, this means your horrible mess of a function is stuck 
below some function and above another copy of that function. In this case, the top line would be 2n squared, and the bottom line would be 1 half n squared. That inner plot obviously looks nothing like our original function, but that's the idea. That we can sandwich some messy function between two much more convenient functions. And those functions look the same. In this case, we can say, formally, with a mathematically rigorous definition, that this function, n squared plus 4n plus 6, grows about the same rate as n squared. Or, in the context of the first video, that it looks like, in whatever context you mean looks like, n squared. Which is the idea that we want to capture. That the important thing is n squared. And we're trying to do that mathematically rigorously. So, we would say, with these two inequalities, and the idea that this happens after n equals 10, we're going to call that n naught as the initial n value for which this is true, the subscript not meaning initial. In that case, what we say is that the function we are interested in, n squared plus 4n plus 6, is in theta of n squared. As in, that function looks like or grows at the same rate as n squared. We will see many, many examples of doing this, gain more familiarity and comfort with the notation as you go through several examples of this.